me close to you Never let me go I lay it all down To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire No one else will do Cause nothing else can take your place To feel the warmth of your Find the way, bring me back to you. Dear, he promised he would be, and he is, and it is a fine good morning to each and every one of you. God bless. It is good to have you out there. Good morning, Miss Cynthia and Mr. Ryan. God bless you. It is good to have you, and right along with you comes Miss Ruth. Good morning, Miss Ruth. How are you doing this morning? And I pray that uh, you give a shout out and a howdy to Kenneth, your, your wonderful husband, and there's Buddy and Julia. Good morning. This is the day the Lord hath made. Yes, it is. And I bet it's sunny there. You know, when I got up this morning, it was sunny out there. It was really nice. And then I've just watched over the last few minutes as the clouds rolled in, and now it's cloudy again. Who knows? At any rate, here we are today. Miss Helen, good morning to you. Give you a wave out there, too. Miss Carolyn, good morning to you. Miss Terry, it is good to have you. Love you, love you, love you. There you go. And there is Miss Sue. And uh, we love her too. And it's, she is with us this morning. God bless. Rick, good morning uh, from uh, the fall guy, I guess. Uh, you know, he, he almost took a real header yesterday. Uh, lost his balance coming uh, yeah, up there. But uh, I hope and I pray you're, you're doing okay. I wondered I was going to 
try to contact you today and see how you're feeling and see if you got any sore spots anywhere. But uh, at any rate, Betsy Singh, yes, says good morning, hi, and good morning to you. Good morning to Jessica. And make sure you say a sweet good morning to sweet Sadie. Boy, what a precious, precious, precious doll she is. What a doll. He just, you know, cuddles in there. She's just the sweetest little baby. So at any rate, good morning to you. Good morning to all of you that are together here this morning. It was beautiful out there this morning. I don't know what it's going to be like the rest of the day, but uh, here we are. Well, let's kind of uh, get ourselves started, all right? Last Friday, uh, we celebrated the 800th consecutive day of Bible studies that we have been meeting together. So that, I guess this makes us 801. When we started uh, Gospel Gleanings way back in 2020, uh, it was to give encouragement uh, to the fellowship uh, during the Easter season that year because the state had locked everything down under mandate and it was in effect. And uh, it was only going to last two weeks, remember that. Uh, of course, none of us really believe that. Uh, though we never cut down, not completely. We did encourage people to follow their conscience and do what they felt was best for them. So in order to encourage our people to give them the opportunity to share together and, and keep community alive, we started this Bible study. Uh, we started with Hebrews, if you remember. That was the first book we went through. I think we're on book number 20 right now. Uh, which is kind of, you know, startling in itself. It immediately began to grow. And by the end of Easter week, we had so many requests to continue uh, that we made the decision that as long as there was an interest, we would continue. And the interest certainly is, ha has held up. I don't really think, and I, I look out there and I see, uh, you know, some folks that, that were, you know, with us from the very beginning. Uh, I really don't think any of us thought it was going to take off the way it has and I'm certainly humbled uh, and a bit in awe at what it is that God's doing. So uh, we start this week. You know, we start this week uh, having looked at the woman with the issue of blood. We're going to start this week with the desperation of Jarius, that synagogue official who had come to Jesus. His story begins at the beginning er, in verse 22 of Mark 5, where it says, When Jesus crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him. And so they stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jarius, all right, came up, seeing him, fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come, lay your hands on her. So she will be made well and live. And then verse 24 says, and he went off with him. A large crowd was falling, pressing in on him. Well, that brought us to a very unexpected interruption with the healing of the woman with a, a, an issue of blood. Love you and your sweet wife. Uh, let's see. Sherry says, good morning, dear brothers and sisters. Let's celebrate our mighty king. He does rule over all. Love you and your sweet wife. All right. Hey, listen, I want to give a shout out to Teresa and to jo June. They joined yesterday and uh, became a, 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 a part of, of this fellowship. And and uh, we rejoice in that. So we give a shout out and say, howdy, howdy, and welcome. All right. And, and this begins in verse 25. Immediately after, a woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and endured much at the hands of many physicians and spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd and touched his cloak. Actually, uh, what she did is is really a bold and, and desperate move. When she touched him, she is really, really as low as you get, at least kneeling, maybe crawling, maybe on her belly, who knows, but she reaches up and touches the hem of his garment, the caspidon uh, of his garment, those tassels that hang down. Uh, and immediately the power went out of him, and she was immediately healed of her condition. That's what verse 26 says, or 29 says, immediately the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. And just as immediately Jesus knew that the power had gone out from him. That's the very next thing that said immediately. Look at how many times that word is repeat. 
that Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around the crowd saying, Who touched my garments? Now, all forward progress to Jairus' house has now come to an immediate halt, and Jesus takes the time needed to encourage this one who had shown, shown such, such incredible, incredible faith. The removal of her unclean physical condition parallels the process of salvation in which Jesus removes our unclean spiritual condition and brings us from death to life. The miracle is an illustration of salvation. Jesus took what was unclean, and he made it clean. And we also need to see here that Jesus was never too busy to be interrupted. He never let the pressing overtake the urgent, the necessary. The compassion of Jesus demonstrated in this miracle should bring reassurance to each and every one of us that he's never too busy, too busy with the rest of the world to care about you or me individually. After prayer, we're going to pick up on Jarius's story. All right? Father, I want to thank you that we can come on this Monday morning and begin uh, this weekday, Lord, this, this, this week of days that uh, we might begin it in your presence with open Bibles and open hearts and minds open to be filled with you. We desire, each of us, Lord, I pray, to, to hunger for a word from you, spoken individually to each one of our hearts, because that's exactly the way it works, Lord. Oh, your word may go out to all of us that are listening, but Lord, it's truly you speaking to each one of us individually. We need to hear you. And what you have to say to one may not be the same that you're going to say to the other, but Lord, your voice will be clear. Give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see. Give us open and ready hearts to receive the engrafted word of God. Lord, give us the courage to make the adjustments in our life necessary to go out and live boldly for you in the world in which you have placed us. Lord, we give this day, we give this week to you. Be magnified, O oh Lord, in all that we do. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, lest you all think that only those folks that sign in are the ones that are here, I would tell you we've got uh, uh, right now by calculation you know, well over 100 people plugged in and listening. So good morning, all of you, and uh, we give you a shout out. Let's see what time. It's 9 in the morning here, which would make it, well, make it about midnight in the Philippines. So I doubt that they're on with the Perudos. I don't have any idea what's going on there. But let's jump back. Let's get back into Jarius, all right? In my mind, Jarius had to be just a little bit irritated by the Lord's uh, uh, seemingly unnecessary delay. His daughter, uh, her life was at stake. And, and uh, uh, after all, at verse 35, we get the bad news. It says, while he was still speaking, while Jesus was still talking to this woman, they came up from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died. And maybe even trying to pull him away from you know, the crowd, why trouble the teacher anymore? You see, Mark picks this story up with an abrupt message from Jairus' uh, home uh, that his only daughter, his 12-year-old daughter, ha has died. The delay caused by the hemorrhaging woman proved fatal for Jairus' daughter. Now, I don't know how quickly thoughts went through his mind. I know I've been in a situation where I've got the unexpected news that somebody has died, and I know the kind of things that rush through my head You know, at that period of time. I've been with a number of people making that notification. They have just found out uh, that a loved one has died, and, and, and I can watch the wheels turn as, as a thousand and one things just keep, you know, just, just flood through their mind one at a time, just you know, like a freight train going through. Uh, no doubt. Uh, this abrupt message caused uh, uh, a lot of emotion. Uh, everything from shock to horror, 
maybe to immediate anger flooding up. That would be a normal response. Here's a woman who is unworthy in comparison to this man's station in life. And Jesus had stopped to tend to her, and my daughter died. He, his world, no doubt, had come crashing down with a report from his servant that his daughter was dead. A common belief in, in, in his day and in ours that where there is life, uh, there is still hope. And when uh, and, and now all, all, all hope is gone. It's it, it just been taken away. Laura's on her way to Tacoma to be with Michaela for Riley's surgery tomorrow. I was going to bring that up. I have that alert up there on top of my screen. Uh, and she will be the first surgery of the day, early in the AMAM. They're going to be doing some, uh, well, I'm removing tonsils, but some other things going down and, and looking because of the, some of the problems that she's had. And then with uh, an issue that we have in the family called malignant hyperthermia, uh, they want to keep her isolated from all other uh, uh, surgical patients, so she'll be the first, and then she'll be in isolation for the recovery. So Laura's going down for a couple of days to uh, to help Michaela at that time. So pray for Riley, and pray for Michaela, and for Laura during this time as well, and for Sean, because he's down in Atlanta, he's down in, the jo in Georgia, and can't be with his wife and daughter during this time. So you have that prayer request from the Ruptac household to yours, okay? Where there's life, there's hope. And when it, uh, all hope is, is gone now. Jesus had power to calm the sea, to exercise demons, and to heal this woman from, from her own touch. Nothing he did. But certainly death would be too difficult to reverse. I mean, after all, who had ever heard of someone being brought back to life? would have been natural for this ruler at this point uh, to have rent his inner garment because that was the cultural side immediately to, to grab that inner garment and, 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 and rip it and tear it. It was a cultural sign of inner grief. When he received the news uh, from, from his household, you know, he would have immediately, you know, because we see that's exactly what's happened as the story goes on, following the cultural tradition of the day. But Jesus's a uh, swift interjection may have prevented him from having even the time to perform such a culturally accepted act of sorrow, which I think gives us a little bit more understanding when he approaches his home and the whole discussion and dialogue because he's not fitting the pattern. He's not doing what was customary, what was expected of him. Now, certainly, if the man whom Jarius had trusted to heal his daughter was assuring him of some positive outcome of the situation, he could only continue to believe uh, that there was going to be a twist to the story, uh, even if he couldn't realize what it was you know, at the time. Verse 36, it says, But Jesus, overhe Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. Do not keep on keeping on being afraid. And, and, and you could, that's, that's exactly what that's saying. And you can put it in great big bold letters. Only believe. Folks, that just keeps coming back and coming back and pounding at us, does it not? Uh, yesterday, uh, it wasn't by the works of righteousness uh, in his own right that Abraham was saved or made righteous. But Abraham believed, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Only believe. I was thinking about that. Uh, even as I was preaching, it was flooding through my mind. And having had this discussion a number of times, you know, uh, when God called Abraham out of Ur of Chaldee, did he leave Ur of Chaldee in order to believe? Or did he leave Ur of Chaldee because he believed. Well, every indication in Abraham's life is he believed, and that led him to action. You see, people, it isn't our action. It isn't our working toward believing, toward faith. It is working from faith, from a position of faith, from a relationship to faith. Only believe. 
That's, that's a lesson that we need to be reassured of and told over and over and over and taught and reminded. We need to look ourselves in the mirror sometimes and say, listen, I know that things don't seem to be going quite right, but only believe. God is able. God is capable. Dryas had exercised faith in coming to Jesus. And now Jesus is telling him, this isn't the time to stop. Just keep on having faith faith. The word believe is a verb. It's the verb form of the same word that we get the word faith, which is a noun in, in its construction. You see, the object of faith is Jesus Christ. And now Jesus is telling him not to be afraid. Only believe. Have faith. You're with me. I'm with you. You came to the right source when you, you caught me at the lake shore. Now, keep on believing. Only believe. And he goes on and says, He allowed no one to accompany him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. He let anyone follow him. The crowd had to stay behind. In fact, the rest of the disciples probably were there to, to, to be a shield, a wall, to keep the tr crowd from following him. This was not going to be public. It was going to be a private event, private instruction. The miracle is for Jairus and his family and this inner circle of disciples. Now, i got to tell you, I, I don't know. I know enough about human nature that I, I, I could kind of suppose over time how the rest of them uh, you know, may have felt about this. Well, there's James, Peter, and John. They're the teacher's pet. We don't get any of that from this scene. We just know that he took the, the inner core, those three, with him, and the rest stayed behind. And they came to the house of uh, the synagogue official, and they saw the commotion. And people were loudly weeping and wailing. Now, I don't know whether you've ever been in a Near Eastern, a uh, uh, Southeastern culture, how many times you have seen uh, grief, you know, in this culture? There are some cultures that uh, that uh, part of their cultural uh, heritage and significance is the way that they express grief. Well, they came to the house of the synagogue official and they saw the commotion. Uh, that's really a mild word to what they probably found, and people were loudly weeping and wailing. Uh, I've, I gotta tell you, it, it, it's kind of a blood curdling, a, 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 a goose bumble thing to watch as, uh, as they, you know, it, and, and I've been in this situation where they take ash and they put ash all over their, their head and their body and they, and they tear their clothes and they beat their body and they, they, they cry and they wail and they trill and, you know, uh, there's no consolation in that. You just step back and watch it. Well, outside the home, there's this giant commotion, which is typical of the Near Eastern funeral uh, uh, process. It already begun. It was customary in those days, as it is even even to today in some cultures, to hire mourning mourners that uh, bemoan. In fact, they're professional mourners, and they bemoan the death of an individual. And it creates a terrible frenzy around it. Uh, they would rip their garments apart and they would tear their hair out and they would cry and shriek and howl, throw dirt up in the air and, and, and the dust coming down. They would beat the ground. They would fall on the ground. It, 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 but even though there was some degree of professionalism about this, it represents a terrible sense of despair that people, people even in Israel, had come to face when they faced death. Oh, well, listen, there was absolutely none of the stoic resignation that you would see perhaps in the Greek culture or move on forward in history and European cultures and things where you were to hold it in and, 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 and uh, boy, in our house, when, when somebody died and uh, you went off by yourself and, and, and cried, I mean, you, you, you held it in as much as you can. And, uh, uh, 
But this is an awful, horrible crying out, this frenzy of despair, this sense of hopelessness at the finality of death's cold grip upon this child. The presence of mourners show us that everything had been done in keeping with Jewish tradition. And the next step? Well, no doubt is that upon the return of Jarius, which they expected to see him come wailing down the road with his clothing in, in, in tatters as he has torn his clothing, dirt on his, his face, they expected to see that. That's not what they saw, of course. But when he got home, the final funeral directions would be made. The girl would be uh, washed and bathed and, and spices and, and perfume be put on, and they would begin to wrap her and put spices in the wrapping. And before, uh, before long, she would be carried out to the, to the family tomb and there you know, put in the tomb because burial had to take place within the first 24 hours. Well, in entering, or and entering it, he said to them, why make a commotion? In other words, why all the racket, people? Why all the weeping? The child's not dead, but asleep. Now, with the use of the expression, the euphemism of sleep, the Lord didn't mean that the girl had not died but was indirectly stating that those who have entered into the kingdom of God, death is not a permanent state, only a temporary one. It's the same terminology that Paul uses for those who precede us in death when writing to the church in Thessalonica. Well, look at verse 13 in the Amplified. Now, we don't want you to be uninformed, believers, about those who are asleep in death, so that you will not grieve for them as others do who have no hope beyond this present life. So it's, it's a euphemism for, for physical death. Paul even uses this term for believers who, who have died in 1 Corinthians 11 and, 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 and chapter, chapter 11, chapter 15. But as for Jarius's daughter, death could not claim this girl. Why? because the Prince of Life was present. Now, Dr. Luke, both doctor and historian, adds a wonderful, wonderful little detail here that gives us that, that great assurance that she's just not in a coma. Uh, she is actually dead. In Luke 8, and verse 55, it says, And her spirit returned, and she rose immediately, and he gave orders for something to be given to her to eat. Now, difficult to interpret as a resuscitation of someone from a coma because Luke, Dr. Luke, implies that the girl was no longer in her body, but she came back upon Jesus' command very much. Like with Lazarus, Jesus says the same thing with Lazarus, the disciples misunderstood, and he corrects them, saying, no, he's really dead. You know, he's been in the grave. Yeah, but he's really, really dead. And it wasn't until Jesus called him out that his spirit came back, and, and he came out a living, walking, wrapped up body. This word sleep is simply a euphemism for temporal death. Verse 40, they began laughing at him. Grieving just stopped. He just said something foolish and stupid. He just made some sort of uh, 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 insensitive joke, and they began laughing at him. But that didn't go over well. Putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions to enter the room where the girl was. They laughed at Jesus. In their grief, they showed their amazement at his insensitivity and his foolishness. Did he really think that they didn't know the difference between sleep and death? These were professional mourners, people. They knew death when they saw it. It had been coming for a long time. She'd ceased breathing. She'd grown cold. Her body is beginning to stiffen. Have you ever touched a dead body? That you know. You know, it's almost immediately when life leaves that body, something happens to the body. It feels differently. 
So he was talking nonsense. They all knew that this girl was dead. Taking the child by the hand, Mark says, he said to her, Talithakum, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Little girl, child, get up. Does anything stand out to you in this verse? If, if it does, jot it down on your notepad. Jesus violates the Mosaic law. Do you see it? Corpses are unclean. And a corpse uncleanliness was the most serious uncleanliness anyone could contract, rendering a person unclean for seven days. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talithakum, which translated means little girl, I say to you, get up. He violates Mosaic law. Look at Numbers 19 and verse 1. The one who touches the dead body of any person shall be unclean for seven days. Those people that wrap the body, those people that care for the body, preparing it for burial, those people that carry the body to the tomb and put the body in the tomb are ceremonially unclean for seven days and have to go through the whole cleansing ritual before they are deemed ceremonially clean and can enter back again to the synagogue and to worship. This is the second time in this story within a story that Jesus could be declared ceremonially unclean by the religiosity of the day. The moment the woman with the issue of blood who herself was unclean touched him, he was unclean and would have had to go through the ceremonial washing to be cleansed. And now immediately after that, he takes the hand of this dead 12-year-old girl. But again, Jesus does not become unclean, but cleanses the unclean. You see, people, if something unclean were to touch you or me, we would be defiled by that in those terms. Why? Because there's something in us that attracts that which is unclean. It's called that old nature that certainly is dead but not eradicated. But there is none of that in Jesus. There is nothing that would attract sin to Jesus. So he can clean and cleanse the unclean. Mark is writing now, remember, we've said this and we repeat it, so we constantly keep it in mind. His audience that he's writing to is primarily a Gentile audience that uh, cannot be expected to understand the Arabic or the uh, the Hebrew. So he goes on to explain what uh, Talitha Kum means. Characteristically, whenever he cites a non-Greek phrase in his narrative, he immediately provides the Greek equivalent. So verse 42, it says immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old, and immediately they were completely astounded. Immediately, immediately. I mean, there's no delay in this. People, can you see Mark driving home a point? I mean, he's got the point here like, a, like, like a, a nail, and he keeps hitting it with a hammer, pounding it and driving it home. When God works in the life and the heart of an individual, it is immediately. When you call out to him, it is immediately. When you turn to him in faith, it is immediately. When was Abraham deemed righteous? Immediately upon believing. Can we get that? Can we hang on to that? When does God hear our cry? Immediately. It may not seem that way because he doesn't immediately come to the rescue. 
What did God hear? What did Jesus hear Jarius' cry? Oh, back there at the seashore. But he didn't immediately heal the girl. When did, when did Jesus know the condition of Lazarus? Immediately. The answer didn't come for a while. Oh, we have an immediate God. He's never late, though. Put yourself in Jairus' shoes for a moment. Can you imagine your daughter is dead, your heart broken, then Jesus raises her from the dead and she's up and walking. So is it any wonder that we can look at the reaction that they were completely, immediately, they were completely astounded? Well, while earlier miraculous acts by Jesus have regularly evoked a reaction of amazement, the phrasing here raises it to a whole new level of magnitude. This is an earthquake on the uh, 10 on the Richter scale, if you will. The Greek, if translated quite literally, says something like this. They were in ecstasy with great ecstasy. They were being beside themselves. They were being out of their mind with ecstasy, utterly, completely, totally shocked. What wouldn't you be? I certainly would be. The sense is quite clearly that of a, prof a, a profound shock in that uh, what has happened is utterly outside of any intelligible or conceivable human experience. Now, the New Testament records for us that Jesus attended just four funerals in his lifetime. That's now it may have been more, but scripture only gives us four. And that in each one of them he totally disrupted the proceedings completely. Here we have the daughter of Jarius raised from the dead when they're preparing for the final arrangements for her burial. And we'll get to this, but, but think about it. He tells them not to go out and tell anybody. Don't you suppose the word's going to spread pretty rapidly when they see Jarius' daughter skipping around the town? But the second time we see in, in Luke 7, probably this incident takes place before the passage. We, we don't have the time frame, but in, in Luke 7, verses 11 through 18, he meets head on with a funeral procession coming towards him. Coming toward him and the disciples from out of the city of Nain. As he journeys you know, in and, and he raises the dead an only son of, of a mother, and gives that son back to her, raising the son of the widow of Nain. Now, later in his ministry, he meets up with another corpse, corp, corpse near, near Jerusalem, in the town of Bethany, a good friend of him, a man who went by the name of Lazarus. You find that story in John 11. This man had already well known to Jesus. They were good friends. By the time Jesus arrived, he's, he's, he's dead, 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 and a long time dead, four days in the grave. We know his sister says he stinks by now, and if you've ever been around a corpse that's decaying, you understand that smell, having been in the grave for four days. But it didn't stop Jesus from disrupting the morning there and turning it upside down. Now, the final funeral that Jesus attended was his own. When Jesus had the ultimate opportunity to show that he could do uh, what was expected of him and stay dead, he again did what was unexpected and he rose from the grave on the third day. Each funeral, therefore, that Jesus attended, he completely turned upside down and disrupted the proceeding completely. But by doing so, he brought life from death and joy from mourning. Look at verse 43. 
They gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. <laughs> he said that something should be given to her to eat. Jesus didn't want the news spreading. Not not like going out like a herald running up and down the street saying, he did that, you know. No, because he knew what would be the effect. He could not go around restoring everyone from the dead. Had the girl only been healed, there wouldn't have been as much cause to remain quiet. But everyone knew that he performed healings. And Jesus turns to the parents and tells them to give the girl something to eat. Keep it in the family. Now, it's going to get out. We know that. I already mentioned that. I mean, the word spreads. This is, a, this is an important, influential man in town. People have already heard. The news has already spread. Darius' daughter is dead. And the next moment, they're going to see her walking around town and, and, and playing with other kids. And they're going to put two and two together. All right? But it'll be a slower process. And that's what Jesus needs. In Luke's record, Jesus actually commands them to do this, something that, that's, that's a little bit stronger than a mere suggestion that uh, the girl may be hungry. It's almost kind of anticlimactic. Ever thoughtful and compassionate, Jesus suggests that she might be hungry and needs food, and uh, she's been ill for some time, so this is a practical detail that's stuck in the minds of eyewitnesses. Wouldn't have been enough just to raise her from the dead. No, he takes care of the practical needs. It adds nothing to the story except to illustrate Jesus' incredible thoughtfulness and kindness. Perhaps the writer, to him, he thought that when men were raised from spiritual death, well, they also need to be fed continually. Do they not? On the bread of life? Think about that one. When viewed as a whole, the four miracles in Mark 4 and 5 prove that Jesus is not only the Messiah, but he's Lord over all. And because of the time, we're not going to, to pull that apart, but we will begin there tomorrow. All right? You are a blessing, and I earnestly pray that God, in his sovereign grace, will just pour blessing upon blessing on each and every one of you. Father, I thank you for the moments that you've given us together today. I thank you for the incredible story of the raising of Jarius, his daughter. I, I don't have any idea what it would have been like to be in that room. Lord, I, I know that there was a point in time that you gave us our son back when we thought he was gone. And Lord, he may have just been deeply unconscious from the head uh, injury, but, but Lord, to have him start breathing again with deep breaths, I remember that feeling. Sherry remembers that feeling. Remember the rejoicing that, that, that our son was back with us. Nothing like this. But God, thank you that you tend to every detail of our life. Now, Lord, fill us with understanding. Give us those practical applications today. Give us the wisdom that we need to apply what we've learned. And let it, let it be the, the drive within us today to live out the truths of your word. God, we love you. And we praise you and thank you again for these moments in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining today. May God bless you. Have a great, wonderful day. Find a way to express the love of God to someone. Because love comes from him, poured into your heart to be poured out to others. God bless. I'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock.